Hello, and welcome to the June 21st Jupiter Lab Weekly Call, Solstice Edition. Uh, today we have 16 people, nope, 17, a 17th person just joined. We have 17 people on the call. And uh, if you're just joining, please uh, look in the chat. The meeting minutes are linked there. And if you'd like to sign in, please do. And if there's something you would like to talk about, please add an agenda item. I think we have four people on the agenda today. So why don't we get started with Fred, if he's on the call. Is he on the call? Because if he's not, I'll ask for a volunteer to read this issue because I did it last time. I think he just popped no. on. He is on, oh. yeah. Frederick uh, just just joined. Okay, and he's first cool. on the agenda. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's okay, Fred. If Fred, if you're ready to talk, why don't we start with you? If you're not, we'll swap agenda items. Okay, then let's go. <laughs> um, let's start by the latest, as it's the easiest. Uh, just for information, uh, I pushed uh, a PR uh, on the Jupyter Releaser to add support for uh, PyPy Trusted Publisher and NPM Provenance. Uh, so for... Uh, that's uh, one of the new um, uh, security features that's available uh, on PyPy and on NPM. And basically it gives you the opportunity to, um, to link uh, what was done for publishing the, uh, a release. So like uh, you're gonna, on NPM, you're gonna have a badge saying, okay, this release like was uh, done on from that uh, GitHub organization that repository at that commit. And on PyPy, the, uh, what's these things allows is that uh, on the releaser, you don't need to set up a, a PyPy token uh, any longer. Basically, you, you need to set up on PyPy saying uh, one of the way of publishing a package is through a GitHub action from that repository using that workflow. And so it allows to, to uh, avoid to set up one of those tokens for the releaser. Um, so yeah, uh, and uh, you should expect me to push some PR on the Jupyter related project for switching to to those uh, uh, to that new uh, system as uh, it's it's good for security. Um, yeah, that's that was the last the info one. Um, and do we, do we have yeah. authority for uh, for lab? We don't, right? Not yet. Or I, I haven't set up. Uh, okay. Uh, anything yet? The only the the one I tested it on was, is uh, Jupyter Lab Git, mm -hmm. the extension for uh, managing Git repository. Um, the what needs to be done is um, is to set up on PyPy that uh, now you allow uh, the publication from a specific GitHub. So that you need to do some action on PyPy, uh, and then uh, uh, that's about it. Uh, like you need to change also the the workflow, of course, on the repository. Yeah, um, to, that's good. Uh, it will, like you said, it simplifies the token management. Yeah. Unfortunately, but, for NPM, except for the NPM. token, yeah, they, they decided to like uh, add some signatures and some like improve uh, information for the consumer from the provenance of package. But unfortunately, they did not go as far as PyPy, so we still need that NPM token. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a it's a path, it's a step forward, and let's hope that in the future they, they will they will implement something similar. We'll see. Uh, so back to the highlights and the question I have. Um, there's been a, a, a bug issue reported about a, a, uh, uh, an, like a, a bug in the way we deserialize the kernel messages. Uh, basically, we are introducing an empty buffer. Uh, like it's a bit technical for people that are not familiar with the kernel protocol. Um, and uh, there's been, a, David was very reactive. I don't know if he's on the call, uh, doesn't look like it. And uh, basically I would like people that are, that 
I have a better history background. And I think Jason, not to point the finger at you, sorry, but <laughs> you are pinged on the PR. So if you can leave, uh, if some of the older uh, developers of Jupyter Lab can have a look uh, and give their opinion on it, it would be great. Um, yeah. Um, and then the second point, uh, so Eric Charles, thank Jason for the thumbs up. Eric Charles uh, has a push up PR that's improving the, um, the way we display the kernel available to, uh, to be more um, pertinent for the user. Uh, th so this has been merged for uh, in the four branch. Uh, the idea is to backport it in 36X and uh, because it has somehow an impact on the interface, I, I told Eric I would bring the, the point today uh, at the meeting. I think it's okay because basically it's just improving the order of the kernel list when the, when the people is in the select kernel dialog, when the people just ask, okay, well, what are the kernels and please pick one. But yeah, I wanted to hear, like to highlight it here so that, uh, if people wants to comment right now or on the PR, they can do it. If they have uh, uh, opinions that we should not backport it on 36X. So that's that's the question basically. And maybe Eric, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Frederick. Um, so uh, maybe I'm gonna bring a bit more context because what, looking at the kernel selector, you, you can see some, uh, some incoher incoherence or something which is not, uh, which can be better, especially when you define, when you launch your server, a default kernel. And when you upload a, a notebook without any assigned kernel, or if the assigned kernel is no more present. So there are many, many cases and many, many small details that, that can be discussed. So I try to summarize them on the issue. And the PR, which has been merged, as, as you said, Frederick, in, in uh, 4.0, is just something which I think does not really uh, impact the, the UI. It's just unsure that the default kernel is pre-selected and at the top of the group when the notebook has uh, a kernel assigned, which is not existing or has no assigned kernel. There is another action which is open and which I linked uh, at the bottom of the agenda uh, to rethink a bit more the naming and the grouping of those kernels. And, and this may have more impact on the UI, but this is another action. And, and what has been merged in four and what is proposed to merge in 3.6 is very minor uh, change, which ensures the default kernel if it exists, is at the top of the list and pre-selected. So these are two different impacts. Uh, the one we, we asked to be merged in three doses is very minor. And, and I have an, a question, a subsequent question, if this is merged, when can we have a release for 3.6? Thanks, Stefan, for the detail, Eric. just to speak about the release, I think we can do it right after. <laughs> there is no program for it, I think. <laughs> well, there is no emergency, so maybe there is other open issues which can come also on 3.6, I don't know, but if it can be done, it's good also. I don't think there is lots of them. There has been one merge that is a bug, like an improvement on the 3.6x branch that hasn't been released. But so yeah, definitely, okay. if that get merged, we can do a release. Last release was three weeks ago, so it's gonna be a month between the two releases. I think it's good enough. <laughs> so please don't hesitate to comment on the PR if if you have arguments against. I, I guess from the silence that <laughs> people agree on that. Uh, otherwise, uh, and then 
the last PR I'm linking here is uh, the huge one by Nick. It's a very good improvement. So the idea is to, to have the same features as in GitHub to be able to display uh, Mermaid GS uh, syntax as a, the, a graph in the markdown. Um, the main question, so the, this feature is targeting uh, 4.1.0. That doesn't have an ETA yet, but it's going to be in the next feature release. Uh, but the question on the PR that's uh, left right now is: Should so it's this is opening um, uh, the API of the Markdown render to uh, to delegate more out of Mark.js, so the library we are using to, to handle stuff ourselves. So should we create an API to make that pluggable in the JupyterLab sense, or should we keep it uh, closed in the sense that we want to give, um, like to have a, a better control of what should Markdown look like in Jupyter tooling? So basically, uh, Nick also opened a PR with that to, to add the support in NB convert. And if we start to say, okay, people can change the way those graphs are displayed or stuff like that, then it's gonna be tougher for us to ensure um, consistency. And I think people like William, I don't know if William has integrated in CoCalc, he will be probably more happy to know, okay, they included that version of Mermaid, so to have a, better, a similar look and feel, I would prefer to know which version I need to include to, to get the same thing. So I think it's better to not extend that that one specifically. But yeah, if you have comment, no, I don't hesitate to speak right now or on the, the PR and I see Tony, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I think you're taking the best feature from Mist, one of the best features from Mist and putting it into core. And Mist already handles all these directives, right? So like, if you wanted to really extend the language, go use Mist. But like this one is just more that this uh, identifier has become canonical, like in boot camps at this point, you know? So like, I think Mermaid's way more special than just like extending it personally. Yeah, thanks, Tony, I agree. If we wanted to make it extensible in the future, we could do it and it would be a feature. So it wouldn't be backward incompatible. So just as an improvement without needing any additional work, I feel like getting it in without that extension API releasing it, seeing how it lands, and then deciding if there's a market for extending it is, uh, you know, it seems like an okay path to take. Okay, thanks. And uh, the last point, but maybe I don't want to discuss here, maybe we can schedule the discussion for next week, is basically I went through all the repository in the JupyterLab organization and there are a couple of repositories that are officially not archived, but that haven't seen any activities for quite some time. And I think it would be good if we discuss what should be the status of those uh, repositories. Uh, and I propose to maybe schedule the discussion for next week so that people can have a look at those and uh, make a better opinion for themselves rather than me having looked at it and not knowing really what they are about. So yeah, that's my, my proposal for that one. Uh, Frederick, maybe you could uh, add a list of those in the agenda for next week so we can prior look into it. Yeah, it might be good to do like a team compass issue as well, just so we don't lose sight of it and we can continue to discuss it. Because um, I, I like the idea of having a plan to kind of declare a repository as end of life and to you know, redirect people to other newer, more supported repos. Yeah, those are good suggestions. I do, I do it. Cool, thanks. For, um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these hopefully won't require a ton of discussion, but people should see it before we archive something. Um, did you have a last point about Jupyter Releaser, or have you already said that? No, sorry. I already said that. Sorry. Okay, great. <laughs> so that cool. was all for me. <laughs> great. Thanks, Fred. So, uh, yeah, if you could please 
look at these um, repos that Fred's listed sometime between now and next week, or right now. I see people writing comments in them. Um, just um, weighing in, that would be helpful. Um, cool. Okay. So let's carry on. The uh, next person on the agenda today is Jason W. Hey, everyone. Um, couple quick notes. One is a plug for the weekly issue triaging call. We do this at 9 a.m. Pacific on Tuesdays. Um, if you haven't been or you haven't been in a while, we'd love to have you come along. The more people we have to look at new issues, the more likely it is that we'll be able to make a firm decision. You don't have to be an expert or particularly experienced about it, uh, about the projects, but we take a look at new incoming issues for Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook, and Jupyter Lab Desktop, um, and determine are these new issues? Are these um, not duplicated by existing stuff? Um, do we need more information from the requester? So, it, particularly for new contributors to Jupyter, um, this is a great way to make them feel heard and welcomed and provide feedback on their issues. Um, so, if you'd like to help out with that, we'd love to see you. Uh, Tuesdays, nine o'clock um, on the same Zoom channel. Um, one other question that I got from a coworker just earlier this morning, my time, is um, this person's curious about opening a file within Jupyter Lab using a link inside a notebook. So effectively having a link that when you click it, it opens a notebook in a new notebook tab inside the same Jupyter Lab session. Are there any either URL schemas or extensions or other tips that we can offer for that use case? I think it's already the case in Markdown. Yeah. Like if you link to a file. Yeah, relative path. Because, because we have a URL resolver uh, inside the code, and I think it's for supporting that case. Okay. So... What I'm hearing is if if he's trying that and if it's not working, maybe that's a bug. After the this, what's always subtle is that uh, uh, it depends. Like if you spin your server in different home directory, like in different root directory, then the relative path is gonna change. And so, yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly what's the context here. So <laughs> I also think he's using it's HTML. Tricky. Yeah, I think he's using HTML instead of Markdown for it. So I'm wondering if using Markdown for that link might be more um, explicit. But I'll follow up with, with my colleague. And if if it's either a bug or a possible enhancement request, maybe we'll file that and we can keep the discussion going on that. I just figured because of the because of the coincidence in timing, it would be good to ask the group that. Thanks all. Um, that's all I have. So Tony is next on the agenda. Go ahead, Tony. Hey, hi everyone. Great. Uh, number two in a row of triaging. Woo. Um, we're just taking over here. Uh, so um, I am really interested in the next like, say month and a half of focusing on accessibility uh, bits for um, Notebook 7. Um, there is uh, another, there's a new issue uh, by Man From Jupiter. Um, if anybody ever sees Man From Jupiter making issues, they're very serious um, and uh, worth our time. And uh, specifically this one, uh, currently it's split into 15 tasks. I'm not done triaging it yet, um, but what makes me really hopeful uh, in this that I wanted to um, communicate to you all is, uh, let me see. Uh, I'm trying to find this uh, reference. Um, basically, uh, folks, th th this, it, the suggest this, okay, here it is. Um, related to uh, Jupyter Lab 9399, which is the accessibility audit that we got on Jupyter Lab, um, Notebook 7, uh, version 7, is obviously much better and what should be recommended to persons with disabilities and just needs a few small fixes to be fully supporting of low vision, colorblind and ambulatory users. Uh, so uh, I personally see this as super encouraging uh, that we can 
make a big dent in some accessibility. Uh, so if anybody has any time, uh, there's some uh, like low hanging fruit perhaps uh, in these re in uh, these issues that I've triaged. If anybody uh, has any extra information that they can provide in any issues, um, please do. Uh, the The more information that we have, the easier we'll be able it, it'll be to implement these things. Um, and uh, if anybody has any time or has any knowledge about these other tasks, um, it would help me uh, in triaging these too. Uh, or also, uh, so that is my um, first point. Any questions? Cool. Um, I wanted to mention that this is relevant to the Jupyter Lab uh, because uh, some of those issues, at least one that I already identified, triaging them, and uh, I would expect more. They have to fix be fixed on the Jupyter Lab side. Uh, so at least identifying that would be very helpful but uh, yeah thanks tony for creating that th them and uh, thanks to anyone who would be willing to uh, participate and contribute to them yeah thanks for your support and getting that uh those issues uh these issues together andre i appreciate appreciate it um and uh the, I, the next thing i wanted to talk about is an overlapping issue uh so um a few of the ones that I've triaged so far are fairly small, um, but this one is significant and uh, would affect, I don't know if it's Jupyter Lab and Notebook or wherever, um, but right now uh, the current implementation of the file browser is um, a bunch of list items, but it appears as a table and it would have a lot better screen reader affordances if it was marked up as such. Um, so I was curious about if anybody had any initial reactions to changing the file browser to a table like layout, perhaps, uh, versus what it is now. Or just comment in the issue later on. I feel like this is a big one, uh, but being able to navigate to files uh, is super important to use in a classic notebook, right? Cool. All right. Uh, the next one, um, the uh, in in accessibility land, uh, there is a uh, unit of documentation uh, called the um, ARIA uh, authoring practice guides, uh, and these ARIA authoring practice guides. Uh, give have recommendations for patterns when you implement user interface components. So menu bars, um, landmarks, tables, forms, all kinds of stuff. Basically, these are the reference implementations for um, how the interactivity should be. So um, right now, uh, one of the comments that we have accessibility wise is that it takes 20 tab stops to get to a notebook cell in notebook seven. Uh, now there are uh, patterns. Uh, one of them is the toolbar pattern. So uh, where basically you have to tab through all the buttons in the toolbar, restart, run all, so on and so forth, right? Um, that toolbar pattern, uh, the suggestion is to have one, the, the, the first element receive focus, and then remember the last element and be able to use arrow keys to navigate there. That feature is something that we actually have in the menu bar. So we abide the menu bar keyboard pattern with left, right, up, down sort of navigation. But some of the other uh, components like uh, tabs and menu bar or, and toolbars don't abide these APG practices. Uh, would folks, could folks imagine it being possible to update these interactive implementations or do you, would it cause too much of a stir um, changing how the tab stops work. Because right now it definitely is not assistive. Um, you can get there with some workarounds, but it would be better uh, for assistive tech with less tabs. So I think that that question is, um, it's kind of like a, polite thing to ask, but we have it as part of our mission for this application to 
be accessible at a bare minimum for legal reasons, but really for moral reasons and for community reasons. And if it is the case that what people who use screen readers expect is to be able to tap through toolbars that are tied to the most recently used text editor and that we can't currently do that, we should find out how we have to do it. I imagine nothing that we do in this space is backward compatible API wise. So everything here could either be pitched as a feature and do a dot, you know, minor release, or it could be considered even a, a, a patch, a bug fix, and it could be a um, patch release. But yeah, I mean, I think what might be useful is picking components one by one. So starting with, say, the toolbar, make the toolbar tabbable, and then figure out later how to make sure you get from tabbing out of a cell uh, text editor into its toolbar or something. But like the toolbar problem self-contained, right? Yeah. Fred has yes. his hand up. Yeah, I just want to say I agree fully. And I think um, we should definitely consider that as bug uh, because it anyway is uh, inconsistent. As you said, like what is done for accessibility, it basically uh, applies to all softwares, even if people use keyboard navigation and don't need it for accessibility reason. And uh, so it will be, it will, we could consider it's a bug for now. And uh, from the API change, the potential API change point of view, I think we can do uh, what Mike has proposed when we change the dialog tag, uh, meaning that we can bump internal package of Jupyter Lab to say, okay, it's a minor release, but uh, it's a patch release at the application level. I think it's perfectly fine because it's consistent from the from server point of view. This is awesome, y'all. Thank you. Because, uh, yeah, Darian said, you know, there's legal reasons for this. But um, the stuff that we're actually talking about is assistive and, like, making the best experience. These aren't things you can check for. So it's really good that y'all are supporting it in this way. So uh, thank you. And uh, thanks for the comment and the issue, Fred, too. Um, cool. This is a Lumino thing, though, right? No, 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 no. The, the toolbar, the toolbar. It, it is not. Yeah. Okay. It's like actually, it, it's it's one of the PR I want to do since quite some time, but because uh, there is a, an easy way to do it by using a web component and that support it internally and it will be transparent, but whatever. <laughs> it's a de an implementation detail. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Well, I'll open, up, I'll, I'll open up an issue or I'll, I'll expand on this issue and uh, see what it'll uh, take to fix it. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Tony. Um, also, this is a good time to remind everyone that at 15 minutes past the upcoming hour is the accessibility call. So please come. Oh, yeah. So uh, the it's a today we are focusing on hopefully when folks show up, we're going to work together on uh, community proposals. Uh, it was acknowledged last week that we uh, have not been uh, with all of the development focus uh, and uh, things going on. We haven't been so focused on the newcomer experience. And that's always been an avenue uh, that accessibility sort of shined in. So our hope is to figure out way, uh, write some proposals and figure out some ways that we can uh, help onboarding new people and kind of, uh, yeah, get back to that mission. Hope to see you. Great, thanks. Uh, next person on the agenda today is Eric C. C on the call? Yeah, he is. Yeah, uh, I think we already covered uh, part of the of those points with the kernel selector. Uh, just wanted to, to link again to the UX des design uh, issue. Uh, well, uh, because apart from the default kernel selector, you have the notion of preferred kernel. Uh, when you assign a kernel, there is like a language also. Uh, so you can say Python 3 or PySpark, but the language is Python. And the selector shows you stuff around, well, this is all the kernels with the Python 
language, and this is all the sessions with a prefer with a Python. Well, this, this is all the active sessions with Python uh, language as kernel. Um, I think there is some terminology and uh, maybe some some brainstorming to do to to make it more um, readable because at some point preferred is not default uh, and aside is not preferred and so on. So this is, this issue is meant to maybe do do something around those terminology. Um, and yeah, we discussed about the planning for 3.6. So that, that was my points. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Uh, okay, great. So now we have uh, Rosio. Yeah. Um... I forgot to bring this up in the notebook meeting, but since it's some, uh, tied to Jupyter Lab and there's still a few uh, notebook seven people or notebook people, uh, I wanted to uh, kind of ask a, a question, and and that is, um, um, I'm, I'm wondering about the development like process, like um, when there are features that are requested in notebook seven or something along those lines um, that could potentially be uh, applied to Jupyter Lab, or they may have even been requested. For Jupyter Lab, um, what uh, what kind of questions um, should we have answered before, like implementing a, such a feature in Notebook? Uh, um, is it um, like a matter a case by case basis, where um, depends on on the feature that's being sort of proposed and and based on people's uh, willingness to to have that included um, in in Notebook Seven or even Jupyter Lab? Um, is that more of the situation? That uh, we're facing. And for reference, I'm kind of keep I'm have in mind the uh, uh, custom CSS issue, where um, th that was fun that functionality was added into G Notebook Seven, uh, but there was previously some issues like we kind of requested it in Jupyter Lab. So now, um, like uh, in this case, uh, I would think uh, I think I'm we would go with uh, removing moving that functionality from Notebook Seven to Jupyter Lab, uh, potentially if if people are okay with that. Um, but yeah, um, sorry, I'm kind of rambling, but my question is a bit about like sort of the workflow between features that are introduced to Notebook 7 and how how to move them back to Jupyter Lab at some point. Mm -hmm. I have some thoughts, but I talk a lot. Do other people have thoughts? That's why they keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> But I can go ahead then. Um, I think as now uh, we're using Jupyter Lab as the basis for most of the code, we should try R to do everything in Jupyter Lab because it will be beneficial for most user. Um, so yeah, that's my take. And I think I don't know if Jeremy is on the call yet still, but I think it's what Jeremy has used also since he started Notebook 7. It's like everything that I can backport to Jupyter Lab or do in Jupyter Lab, let's do it in Jupyter Lab and then consume in, in Notebook 7. Um, they may be like right now there is there is maybe there is maybe a problem of uh, of timing in the sense that uh, now that we uh, we are in a yeah. We have released Jupyter Lab 4, but you have not yet released Notebook 7. Um, maybe we are a bit slower in, on the Jupyter Lab side to do a new release of the packages, but I think it shouldn't be a problem. We sh like If it's for Notebook 7 and you need a release, we, we should make it happen because doing if it's patch release, there is no problem at all. If it's like minor version, we can probably do it also. It's, yeah, so yeah, that's my... My opinion. So, somewhat surprisingly, I completely agree with Fred. Um, I think for most of the kind of features that we're going to be adding to Notebook, they're going to be features where the implementation in lab will be the way it actually gets delivered anyway. For those features where it really truly is like 
a notebook application feature, you know, we can visit them one by one and decide does that belong in lab as well. But um, yeah, so I mean, if you run into a feature whose implementation is not going to be inside Jupyter Lab Core, but you're curious, hey, should this feature exist in both, then bring it up. But in general, I think assuming that notebook and lab are sibling applications, that they have very uh, um, compatible feature sets, it's just that the notebook user experience is quite different than the lab one, then I think that's a good guiding principle. Does anyone else have anything they want to add? Rosio, is that enough for you to go on? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much to the both of you. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, if we reached the bottom of the agenda. Um, is there anyone who has been holding back and would like to talk about something? Do, do you think anybody would care to see this idealized semantic notebook that I'm talking about? I haven't ever shared it with Jupyter Lab before, um, but the research is kind of at an end. And uh, maybe if there's a little bit of time and we're recording, it would be cool to have this. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, just by way of uh, contextualizing a little bit. So um, there are kind of one and a half or two accessibility calls that regularly happen. And one of them, uh, Tony has presented his conclusion to researching what the notebook document actually is semantically. And Gabriel and I have volunteered to take this vision and try to um, implement it within the notebook, uh, that the at Jupyter Lab notebook package, basically, so that the rendered markup that those packages generate comes out in a way that is accessible to assistive devices. So um, yeah, take it away, Tony. I'd love to see. Really cool. Uh, thanks for that intro. That was uh, super concise. Um, so uh, I've been working for a few months with the Space Telescope Science Institute, and um, our uh, charge has been to uh, make the rendered version of the notebook accessible. Um, so this doesn't really have much to do with the interactive notebook until it did. Um, so this is my rendering here, uh, and it's this is the Lorentz notebook. Um, and uh, it's pretty much the same thing that we're used to seeing. The only thing that's new here is we actually have cell numbers. Um, but none of the, the visual part isn't really uh, what I wanted to get at. It's that when we go and inspect uh, the DOM, um, there aren't any divs in our notebook. Um, so we have a placeholder for our toolbar and our logo. Um, the notebook is in a main section, um, and that has a title, uh, it has an ID, um, and um, inside of the main section, uh, what we needed to do was we needed to be able to uh, capture the ordering of the notebook cells semantically, um, and there is a role uh, called a feed. Um, so a feed is a collection of containers that are meant to be read. Uh, so they're kind of like non-interactive widgets. So in this pattern, you have a section with a roll feed. Uh, there are 16 cells in it. And inside of there, every cell is an article. Um, the article now has uh, aria, pause, and set, which is the location of the cell. Um, it's one indexed. And then we also have the set size. So a screen reader can go and use this information to uh, inform uh, the uh, assistive tech, uh, or is, this informs the assistive tech a little bit better. Um, so one of the feedbacks that we got was that no, it would make sense to tab to notebooks. Like notebooks are a landmark sort of, but it would make sense to tab to notebooks if they were a form. Uh, and that kind of opens up a whole world of tags that you can start using. Um, so we do have a form. And what's really interesting about this is that now every cell is destructured 
and you can access them through their forms. Uh, you can access the inputs without any kind of like DOM behavior. So they're sort of independent there. Um, each cell needed a label uh, and it needs a visible label. Um, the inputs are a thing called a field set. So field sets are used to group interactive widgets. Um, so in our what this actually winds up making is sort of a group area, um, but this is what labels the inside of the cell or the input of the cell. Uh, we have a toolbar implementation here uh, that's not exposed yet. But the idea is, is that from this like accessible resting place, we should be able to make an accessible interactive experience progressively. Uh, we have another field set for the outputs. And then this is a markdown cell. So we have some rendered HTML. Uh, this is what a code cell looks like, so on and so forth. Um, so in accessibility terms, what this means is if we go and we look at our accessibility properties, this is actually where this representation shines the most. Um, if you go and look at pretty much any notebook in this accessibility context, it's a whole lot of generics. Um, if we were to go and look in here right now, uh, to my, oh, it's showing up in another place. Let's not worry about that right now. But uh, nevertheless, what we can actually see is, um, or under, learn from this, is that the, the DOM was actually designed for the screen reader. Um, and you can start to see that there's a lot more richer information and context in here. Um, and screen readers read uh, camel case uh, as if they're separated words. So this mashing of things together is OK. Um, and yeah. Uh, this has been tested on uh, VoiceOver, uh, Chromevox, uh, NVDA. It has not been tested on JAWS. Um, but our goal is to take these things, uh, like to e each of these things in the annotation object model here relates to a DOM node. And what we can see is that by using certain um, tags, uh, we get different roles in here. So from this idealized structure that I showed you to start, what we can go and do is sort of reverse engineer what the ARIA roles and ARIA labels are associated with the notebook. And we're going to kind of put that information back in there and hopefully get an accessibility tree that looks like the one I showed you in notebook seven. Yeah, Fred. That's really, really interesting. Uh, and now comes the annoying question. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, please. No, that's the hope, man. Uh, yeah. Um, knowing that uh, uh, a good chunk of the user are using notebook to produce uh, documentation, um, meaning that the structure of the document is is mainly driven by the eddings. Yeah, what will happen basically? I, I really like the idea. Like this gives a very that, that's the trouble, let's say, of notebook. The, the structure you propose is awesome in the sense that it really represents what's the cell, what's the input, what's the output, and stuff like that. And unfortunately, we have um, we have that use case that people structure things adding uh, eddings in it that yeah. totally are uncoupled with actually the cell structure and so yeah and that's that's always the the question like how do we reconciliate uh, I, I think there is no answer like there is no reconciliation it's like how do we handle the two point of view i think it's more like uh, the question probably <laughs> yeah so so what my experience with this um is um so i'm not worried i'm not working on the heading problem yet i'm trying to work on like basically it's like if we can there's a building and the headings are inside of rooms. I need the hallways to be accessible before I worry about your problem, right? So this is basically a structure that puts landmarks on the page. So landmarks are really important for assistive technology because they offer quick ways to access them on a menu. So you can go and hit like control shift M and that'll show you all the landmarks and you can go to them really quickly. Um, headings are also control or control shift H, right? So there are different navigation structures. Headings are one navigation structure, and landmarks are another navigation structure. Um, one of the this is a I'm going to jump off to another place because I feel like you've vibed with that. Um, one of the other things that I learned here uh, in this process is that when we talk about the static converted notebook, we do a disservice in talking about it statically. 
And what I mean by that is like tab stops are defined by interactive widgets, right? The more interactive crap you put on the page, the more interactive these static documents are, right? So headings as a whole link to itself, huge hit area, great for ambulatory users, but it also adds interactivity there, right? So now you have a heading, you have a link, and it's inside of a landmark, and you have multiple ways to navigate. And that's what we're trying to do here is kind of create, there's a lot of different ways that people use screen readers. It might be tabbing, it might be using these special menus, so on and so forth. But what we're, this is actually opening up another dimension outside of the headings. Like if you screwed up your headings, they're just out of order. When you go and access them, it's actually not all that big of a deal. But like, if you go and you click on that heading and it announces um, this heading is in cell five, that's a helpful thing, right? Because now you can go and access just cell five. So we're kind of creating like layers of redundancy here um, because it's really easy to get lost in a long notebook is another thing we learned. So yeah, there's a, there's a few things. So great question, thank you. Thanks a lot for all the teaching. <laughs> I learned a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Great, cool. Yeah, that's exciting. Cool. Thanks for showing us this. And I'm sure we're going to have to uh, revisit pieces of this as we progress with trying to implement it. Because it might be that the easiest path is a bunch of small PRs, or it might be that the most reasonable path is here's a PR that makes the notebook work with screen readers. I, I don't, I'm not sure yet. Once we start, I think we'll be coming back to this call to show people things and get input on them with some frequency. I after what you said earlier, Darian, I think we are, we're going to focus on one component at a time and just kind of become experts in that or like have a few PRs that are sort of expert. Let's focus on the menu bar. Let's focus on the main landmark. Let's focus on each section or region. And uh, that that's probably gonna make the most focused sense, but we'll find out. So yes, we, yes, we will revisit. Cool, great. Um, is there anyone else who would like to bring up something or I can stop the recording to ask again? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. Brace yourselves. <laughs>